Wednesday, October 18th, 2017. Beijing's square of heavenly peace has made history many times. And even this rainy autumn day can't disguise the signs of big changes happening in China. The 2,000 Communist Party delegates climbing the stairs to the Great Hall of the People exude a newfound self-confidence. They believe they have the respect of the people again and now have little to fear from the exigencies of everyday political life in China. The 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China heralds its return to robust health after years of moral decline. It had been eaten up by corruption, ideological disorientation and internal power struggles. Until this man took the reins, Xi Jinping. In just five years, he has turned the party around with a combination of strategic aptitude and an iron fist. We must support the party leadership in everything. The party is the leader in all aspects of national life. All members must maintain their political integrity. We need to strengthen the ability and determination of the party to draw up plans, shape policies and promote reforms to ensure that the party always takes the lead and coordinates the efforts of everyone involved. Xi Jinping's most important instrument in securing his power is his anti-corruption campaign, which he has used to put corrupt party functionaries behind bars including his rivals. The list of those who have been supposedly allowed to make confessions voluntarily is growing by the day. Written confessions are like trophies made of paper intended as a warning to the people. Deviation from the regime's course will no longer be tolerated. What worries the current leadership most is the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this made the Chinese Communist Party very uncomfortable. People wondered why not a single hero came forward to save what could still be saved when the Russian Party went into crisis. Today's Chinese leaders want to create a hero like that. The Chinese have a tradition of collective culture. They can be miserable on their own, but can easily be proud of their families or the strength of their own country. So it's easy to use this feeling of patriotism and nationalism to captivate the masses. China has been accumulating problems with society, the economy and corruption for decades, and without a strong leader, the country would be in real trouble. That's why Xi Jinping has so much power. But he is very different from Mao and other leaders of the past, because he has a lot of respect for the rule of law. And he probably learnt that from Europe. Xi Jinping's strategy could be called a kind of counter-reformation. Everything is once more trimmed to fit communism, with a large dose of patriotism added to the mix. The party's propaganda machine is running at full speed, not only during the party conference, but capitalism remains untouched. At the time of Deng Xiaoping, you weren't allowed to talk about capitalism but you could simply apply it. China's development model is a capitalist model, but it has to be accompanied by a socialist text. This discrepancy between reality and the way we talk about it has existed for many years. Let's put it this way. The current Chinese leadership wants both Mao's dictatorship as well as the advantages of a market economy. This new patriotism has a name, the Chinese dream. And to make this Chinese dream come true, Xi Jinping has accrued more power 
than anyone else in China since Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. Xi Jinping, the superstar who will lead China into a glorious future. This message is not only broadcast to his own people, but to the whole world. For him, the party's power comes above all else, and he's the unchallenged head of the party. He's the most powerful man not only in China, but possibly the whole world. Several days before the party congress, party members are already flocking to these exhibition grounds in the heart of Beijing. The party takes stock of the past five years, successful ones of course, all thanks to Xi Jinping. I'm very proud to be Chinese. China has developed very well in the last five years. Xi Jinping is great, everybody knows that. He's done a lot, not only for China but for the whole world, and has brought prosperity. We now call him Uncle Xi. He's a great leader and he can develop the country even further. We're also delighted that guests from abroad are coming to visit us in China. China's propaganda department can indeed draw on the full range of resources. China's economic development over the last three decades is unprecedented anywhere in the world. China has lifted 700 million people out of poverty and is already the world's largest trading nation. It intends to overtake the United States' gross domestic product within the next 10 years. And the regime has a master plan for it all. Made in China 2025, an initiative aimed at the most important industrial sectors. Ten of them are to be transformed into global leaders. The automotive industry, high-performance trains, pharmaceuticals, aircraft construction and artificial intelligence, to name but a few. This is planned economy 4.0, and China really is going for broke. Overseas mergers and acquisitions by Chinese investors and companies are watched with suspicion abroad, but communist China has ample capital. The recent developments make me feel that our country is great. It makes me proud. I just got back after spending 15 years in Australia. I didn't even recognize Beijing. Ever since the Olympic Games, Beijing has become a world-class city. But all the glitters is not gold. China is also feeling the distortions of the globalized economy. The first stock market crash in 2015 caught the Chinese leadership on the wrong foot, and it only managed to neutralize the effects of speculation bubbles to some extent with enormous infusions of state money. Excessive optimism has led to vast indebtedness in the public sector, a risk financial experts say shouldn't be underestimated. Provincial towns want subways and public buildings that will outdo their neighbors. And what today is still just a model will be a reality tomorrow. Everything is possible. It's the Chinese dream. China's economy is undergoing a radical change. Although it's still the world's biggest producer of cheap goods, this economic model is already on the wane. The question is, what should be done with the country's enormous industrial capacities? China's best-known project, the so-called New Silk Road, offers one solution. Using Chinese construction companies and labor, China will plan, finance and build rail links, ports, highways and airports across dozens of countries westward. It's a tempting offer for some countries, especially ones with developing economies that can't afford such infrastructure investments. Globalization is failing. Think about European integration or the fact that common markets don't work. The World Trade Organization hasn't developed at all. How can the problem of integration be solved in order to promote cooperation? The new Silk Road can do this. 
bring China, Europe, Asia, Africa and Latin America all together with a common free trade agreement and common solutions. So the new Silk Road will be welcome everywhere. China's foreign spending plans are often compared to the U.S. Marshall Plan after the Second World War. But this is very misleading. The new Silk Road is not a reconstruction project. Everyone can participate, but China dictates the conditions. This means China is not only creating new traffic routes, but also new dependencies, with new markets for its own overproduction as a bonus. But China does not want to make the world Chinese. Why should it? The current world order with its globalized economy seems to be tailor-made for China's plans. International institutions guarantee China's trade rights, and the U.S. Navy and Air Force protect global trade routes. Why give all that up? Chinese politicians have repeatedly insisted that the Chinese model is not for export. Anyone who wants to can join, but no one should be forced. Mao Zedong made China great, Deng Xiaoping made it rich, and now Xi Jinping wants to make it strong. The Chinese people will have no objection to that as long as they have something to gain from it. But not all Chinese are benefiting equally from the boom. China is home to more billionaires than ever before, but the average citizen has to work hard to make ends meet. Everyone in China still seems to be pulling in the same direction. But this could change quickly if the gap between rich and poor continues to widen. As yet, China's success can still be felt by the population. The Yin family is one of many who have benefited from China's economic growth in recent decades. In Europe, they'd be called prosperous middle class. They have an apartment in the center of Beijing, a car, and they take vacations. Both spouses have good jobs, and their daughter Zhao Zhao has a sheltered childhood. Five years ago, we didn't have this house. But thanks to our savings and the fact that our former apartment went up in value, we could afford this larger apartment in a very beautiful area. We are very satisfied with our living environment, which is also a good place to raise our child. And because we now earn more, we can improve our living conditions and the lives of our children. The fact that you can improve your lifestyle through hard work makes me very happy and satisfied. Chinese-style capitalism pays well enough for the educated middle classes, and politics plays a minor role in everyday life. All you hear in nearly every household is, the ruling classes are doing a good job, and Xi Jinping does his job very well. That applies even to those households that have benefited less from the economic boom of recent years. Farther out from the center of Beijing, you find people who are doing better than they used to, but who still need all their strength to make ends meet. Working poor, also a characteristic of Chinese-style capitalism. <laughs> Wang Yang lives with his girlfriend, mother and stepfather in a few square meters without heating, for which they pay about 200 euros per month. <laughs> that money has to be earned and everybody has to pitch in. Nevertheless, Wang still thinks that things are picking up. When I first came here, I earned 2,000 won, about 280 euros per month, and life was quite difficult, but now things are better. Maybe in 10 years, my life will look quite different in many ways. Right now, I don't earn enough to feed a family and lead a decent life. Although things have been improving steadily over the past few years, I'm still a long way from that goal. But I am optimistic. Stepfather Yu has to make an effort if he wants to keep up with the rise of China. Every day he crisscrosses Beijing on his moped, delivering packed lunches. 
he covers many kilometers for little money. It's enough to survive, but he's unlikely to ever experience the same prosperity already enjoyed by his customers. Poorer people can also achieve a good standard of living with things such as fair pay, health care and pensions. I hope we can become a relatively prosperous society even faster. China has to continue to force the pace. In four years' time, the Communist Party will celebrate its 100th birthday. That's the deadline for Xi Jinping's first centennial goal, to build a moderately prosperous society for at least a billion Chinese. China has great ambitions. That's not only in evidence at party conferences, you just have to take a look at the sort of maps that are common here. Here you can see at a glance which place China prefers to occupy in the world, the center. On this map, Europe and the US are on the world's margins. As China builds up its presence on the world political stage, as a host, intermediary or investor, its foreign policy has also become dynamic, quite incredibly dynamic in fact. In the interests of the Chinese and also of the Americans and all other people in the world, Xi Jinping said that we must shape the future together. There is a great deal that can be done and, in detail, there are three directives that Xi Jinping also mentioned. Firstly, the leadership of the international community. Secondly, the creation of a new international order, including the economic, political and military order. I believe that the military order must also be included. And thirdly, the leadership of the international community to create common economic, political and territorial security, etc., as well as the management of a fair economic globalization process. When we speak of a superpower, it's not only about power but also about a way of thinking and behaving that tends to focus only on one's own interest when interfering in other countries' affairs, thoughtlessly, without allowing them to participate in the process, without equality. And that's why we hate the idea of superpowers. China is probably already an economic superpower, but we are not an ideological superpower. We don't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. We value diversity and the rule of law. Law. We have a different ideology, unlike the American Christian mentality, which is always seeking to convert everyone else. Nevertheless, China is upgrading its armed forces rapidly. Xi Jinping says the military is his responsibility and he intends to take China's to the top. In pursuit of this goal, Beijing is investing huge sums of money in armaments, military training and public relations work. China is the world leader on the electronic battlefield. The party has transformed the internet in China into the world's largest intranet. A solid electronic wall surrounds the country and sets limits on the electronic freedom of China's 750 million internet users. Foreign internet giants who refuse to accept China's terms and conditions are shut out. Not only that, but social media, the very epitome of borderless global communication, has been turned into an instrument of surveillance. You can't do anything in China without a smartphone, much to the delight of the companies that harvest data and sell it on to other businesses. And also much to the delight of the state's eyes and ears, which gain an ever greater insight into what people think with every click they make. The Orwellian surveillance state is being built right here in China. In reality, the current leadership's vision is of a red empire rather than the so-called Chinese dream. Xi has switched from the Maoist imperative of revolution to the imperative of capital. He has launched the New Silk Road and pushed the Chinese currency into the financial markets to establish it globally. 
He has also promoted the acquisition of a lot of foreign companies and technology and the development of numerous infrastructure projects. And now China is building up its armed forces with the aim of becoming a naval power. I think that could be a risk to the rest of the world. Because a friendly dragon is, nonetheless, still a dragon. And the current global situation isn't facilitating China's pretensions to leadership on the world stage. The biggest risk factor lies just behind its border to the east. North Korea's game of nuclear poker with the US has also left China on the brink of diplomatic despair. Lesson number one. Formulating foreign policy is easy, but actually solving conflicts is much more difficult. Harmony in China alone will evidently not suffice. China's unpredictable neighbor may be a formal ally, but behind the scenes their relationship is anything but harmonious. China is becoming impatient with North Korea's grand standing. All Beijing wants is peace and quiet on its borders. Just how unharmonious the relationship with China can be is particularly noticeable in neighboring countries. Beijing is building up artificial islands in the South China Sea to further its territorial claims there. Hong Kong, which has been a special administrative zone since 1997, is also feeling the pressure. The former British Crown Colony was granted special democratic rights until 2047, rights that do not exist on the mainland. But the Hong Kong democracy movement, the so-called Umbrella Revolution, is slowly running out of steam. Beijing is taking an increasingly direct role in Hong Kong's affairs, and activists there fear the one country, two systems principle could become one of one country, one system, sooner rather than later. Beijing, meanwhile, is still dreaming and would like everyone else to share the dream. The dream of the Chinese people is closely linked to the dreams of the peoples of the rest of the world. It can only be achieved in a peaceful, stable international order. We must take account of both the domestic and the international situation and continue to pursue a mutually beneficial strategy of openness. On her way to work, Zhao Jinhua is also dreaming of prosperity. But her job as a nanny will never bring that, and the gap between relative and real prosperity continues to widen. When Zhao looks after the children of foreigners, she sees what a better life could really be like. She wants that for herself too. That is her Chinese dream. I think our lives will get even better in the next five or ten years. I don't have a lot of opportunities, but my son's life will get better and better if he knuckles down. And that will relieve me of some of my burden. He works hard and his life will certainly improve, and then mine will be easier too. Xiao Jinhua can only dream of a secure job in a company or even as a civil servant. Chinese capitalism means employment is always precarious. This placement agency gives her the odd short-term work assignment, and she is not the only one in China who is in that position. I think the national reforms have done a lot of good for my home city. Since Xi Jinping came to power, the country has been doing very well and his policies are very good for the people. For the poor, he has introduced a minimum wage and social housing, and there are subsidies for people who can't work or who don't earn enough to sustain themselves. Xi Jinping is a really good guy. Everybody in China loves him. As long as they also benefit from China's growth into a world power, the people will continue to support Xi Jinping's policies. 
China's annual economic growth is still big enough to be felt in Beijing's less prosperous districts. But what if growth stalls one day? The Communist Party's second centennial goal is set for 2049, a hundred years after the founding of the People's Republic of China. By then, Beijing is seeking to have modernized all sectors of society and achieve the level of prosperity of an emerging economy. I think we'll be able to move to a bigger house within the next five years, and I expect my life to improve a lot. In five years' time, my daughter will be seven. She'll be at primary school, and we'll probably move to another place closer to her school. Or maybe we'll still be here, and we'll drive her there. Whatever happens, I'm very optimistic about the future. The tremendous public optimism is striking. Everyone is doing better than their parents did in their day, and people are convinced their children will be even better off in the future than they are now. What do Europeans say when they are asked whether their children's lives will be better than their own? Hundred-year goals, the Chinese dream, state-led capitalism, whatever you want to call it, one thing is certain. This man knows where he wants to go and has the power to get there. So what does the West have? The West is also powerful, but on the retreat in Asia, and the consequences are unforeseeable. And what about Europe? Europe doesn't have just one strategy, it has dozens of them, ranging from currying favor to erecting barriers, which is not something that is likely to hinder China on its way to becoming a global power.